three, two, one. Welcome to the uh, August 30, 30th meeting of Infrastructure and Economic Development. Uh, uh, I am the chair, Mike O'Connor, with uh, Councillor Blackmore, Councillor Bosch, and Mayor Clayton. Uh, we'll call a meeting to order. There is no delegation business, and under reports, we'll go to 3.41, Director of Service Area Report, Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. We'll start in economic development. Since the last meeting, we've had six new businesses open up, uh, as well with the Rural Renewer em Renewal Employer application. So this is the immigration program that the city was approved for. We've had 10 applications currently. Three have been approved. However, we are receiving a lot of interest, so they are working with quite a few businesses on this at the moment. Uh, but uh, so far, it's going fairly well. Uh, in healthcare, uh, we've issued nine passes to new uh, to nine new resident doctors for the East Link Center. Uh, this is a program that we run through economic development for uh, any resident doctors uh, that they can uh, get free of charge. In energy and environment, we have our last orchard tour scheduled for Tuesday, September 7th in Dalen Park, and uh, that is from 6 p.m. to 7, I believe, and you just have to show up. In Engineering services, we've closed uh, the RFP for traffic signals design and construction, the South Bear Creek, Creek baseball diamond lighting, as well as the Bear River control or corridor assessment. In transportation, uh, we are continuing to do some uh, maintenance spot sweeping around intersections and rail crossings on the roads. Uh, as well, we have recently completed the last application of dust control on gravel roads. In traffic engineering, we have uh, wrapped up our annual crosswalk painting program, uh, getting to all the school zone crosswalks, having two coats over the course of the summer. Uh, and now crews are moving to city parking lots, focusing on renewal and handicap uh, space markings to complete the season. As well with traffic engineering, we've made some minor adjustments to the intersection of 68th Avenue and O'Brien Lake Drive. This is in advance of the school opening in that neighborhood to uh, hopefully alleviate some of the traffic congestion that were, is likely to occur at drop off. Uh, as well with the Highway 40 project the province is doing, there'll be a set of lights put uh, on Highway 40 in O'Brien Lake, uh, which should further help things when those are installed. Uh, in parks, uh, the uh, hot and dry weather has slowed grass growth, so we're, we continue to do um, some spot mowing. However, uh, you won't see the mowers quite as frequently as you have been, and those uh, staff members are have been redeployed to other duties. And with that, I'll take any questions. Okay, open it up. Uh, Mayor Clayton and uh, Councillor Blackmore. Thanks, Chair O'Connor. Uh, Director Glavin, in regards to transportation and the intersection coming out of O'Brien heading east. Um, do you have a time frame? Do, do we have an update on Highway 40 in regards to the construction that's happening? Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Uh, so as far as the intersections, uh, they're supposed to be, in, or the street lights are supposed to be installed before the end of this construction season. I don't have exact dates from the province. That was the last I heard. Can you do... Um would you like a motion or can you get council an update? Can we have Alberta Transportation come and give us an update on that project? Uh, you know, it ha obviously has significant impact in our city through as we move through winter and transportation. And so uh, could we get, to, if you want a motion, I'm happy to do so. But if not, could we get Alberta Transportation to come give us an update on that? Thanks, Chair O'Connor. Uh, we have reached out to Alberta Transportation already to have them come to a meeting. We're just trying to coordinate a date for them to come uh, apprise council of any of the projects that they have in the Northwest. Uh, and in the meantime, I can get an update. I don't need a motion and I can report back to committee and council. Thank you, appreciate that. Council, uh, Councillor Blackmore. Uh, yes, Director Glavin, can you give me an idea what our standards are for dust control in road construction projects? I'm thinking of the construction at the um, south end of 92nd Street um, against uh, Country Club North. It's very dusty there. Today I noticed the road had been sprayed, but generally that has not been happening. So we must have some kind of construction standard, albeit less onerous than California. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Off the top of my head, I don't know what the exact standard is, but that is something I could report back with. I would appreciate that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor, uh, Mayor Clayton. Thanks so much. Uh, Director Glavin, can you give me a, um, some background information or um, is there a process in regards to uh, construction areas in identifying whose project it is? Um, I know that Council approved a significant construction, uh, road rehabilitation and construction season. However, there are projects that are of significant nature that aren't City of Grand Prairie projects. And so I'm curious um, if we've ever looked at identifying a work site. If it's an Aquaterra project, Aquaterra could maybe have a sign up um, so that the understanding of for residents of who to contact in regards to these projects. Director Glavin. Thanks, Chair O'Connor. So right now, the only place that it gets posted is on the city's traffic planner, so it's not being posted on the actual physical site of construction. The only time we have typically had signs is when they've been grant funded by either the provincial or federal government, and that was a requirement of the grant funding, but as of this time, there is no requirement to have a sign for construction for whether it be Aquaterra or ATCO. So can you tell those who may be watching and for Council's information, the easiest way for residents to find out whose construction projects are whose? Yeah, the easiest way is to go on to cityofgp.com and search for traffic planner and it's on there. Um, it's probably not a well-known tool that you would go on to find out who specifically is doing the construction, but we use it for coordination and so that residents can see when tr uh, projects start and are expected to finish. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Seeing none, we will move down to 3.2, Water North Coalition and the great Michelle Gardner. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Uh, the Water North Coalition was formed in 2014. It is a group of northern municipalities, First Nation communities, and Métis settlements. The focus of Water North is sustainability of water systems in northern Alberta. The city was a member of the coalition in 2015 and 2016. A member of council was appointed to the coalition and administration provided support and attended meetings. Administration also assisted on a couple of subcommittees. In 2017, council chose not to appoint anyone to the coalition and discontinued involvement. In May of this year, Bob Marshall, chair of the Water North Coalition, requested the city re-engage with the coalition. Advocacy is more effective as a regional approach and with more municipalities involved. Administration is recommending that uh, the city re-engage with Water North and administration pr participate as support. With that, I could take any questions. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ms. Gardner. Um, are there any questions? And before we take questions, I think it's really important that uh, water is going to be a commodity with the weather changes that are coming along. So I think we need to be part of this solution. And uh, Councillor Blackmore. Uh, yes, Ms. Gardner, can you tell me, I know that Council has uh, not appointed anyone to this for a number of years, but has administration still maintained any connection or support uh, during the time that council has been away from the table. Thank you. Chair O'Connor, administration has not participated with Water North Coalition once uh, council no longer was involved. So, so a lawyer, there's no costs that you've identified in your report. There would, in fact, be some, some costs, um, although they, you know, would be included in your everyday duties, but it would still be part of your time allotment, right? Or whoever is assigned to the coalition. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Yes, there would be some costs that are currently included in everyday tasks within the department. So there would be some labor time spent attending meetings, which was identified in the report, as well as potentially assisting. Um, we anticipated that to be approximately 10 to 15 hours a year. So very minimal in time. Okay, thank you. Yes, before I go to Mayor Clayton, I just want to point out that it meets twice per year and it's uh, administration and a council position. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, Mayor Clayton. Thanks, Chair O'Connor. Uh, Ms. Gardner, can you tell me uh, why Aquaterra is a non-voting member of the coalition? Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Um, 
in entities such as Aquaterra ed educational institutes are non-voting members and are there as support in order to not influence. So it is municipal, local government driven. So by local government, I mean municipalities, First Nation communities and Métis settlements, and then watersheds there so that they're in there they're as a participant. Um, everybody else is providing technical support. But as with Aquaterra being a municipally controlled corporation, it's. I think that it's realistic that they could be the representative of the municipalities, is what previous councils have believed. So no, no necessary for an answer for that. Thanks. Um, any other questions, uh, Mr. Thiessen, Council? Thank you, Chair O'Connor, uh, Mr. Mike. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm no no questions uh, for Ms. Gardner. Uh, maybe just a clarification uh, on, on the roles and duties. So as Ms. Gardner said, Aquaterra has always just been uh, part, of, part of the technical expertise, no voting members. Uh, and part of the mission of the Water North Coalition is to ensure that people have access to clean, safe drinking water, like in the Northern Parallels and some of our communities that don't have that. As the last uh, rep on Water North Coalition, I was sad to, to come off of it because for me it just always ran into other meetings, so I wasn't able to participate as much as I would. But largely this group is, is an advocacy group, uh, and it, it works for the North in, in a whole. And I think what Councillor Marshall uh, had appealed to Council, this is probably his third time trying to get us back on, on the board, um, is that advocacy they need, they need is a multi-pronged approach. So it comes from our rural municipalities, it comes from our villages and towns, and it comes from the cities, every opportunity that we get to ensure that. Uh, I think it works within our, our goals and also the federal goals, um, uh, as long as the, the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and our calls to action to ensure that uh, First Nations communities have access to safe potable water. Um, so that's one of the things that we could advocate for. Um, and I'm all for joining in. I think if council is, is amenable to appointing another member, I, I would put my name forward as that being the chair of the Mighty Peace Watershed. Uh, that was the biggest conflict of time between it all. Um, but we now also sit on the board there as well. So as the chair, we have administration there uh, to help with uh, the Aquaterra technical expertise and uh, to have another elected official. But again, that's up to council to decide, but I just wanted to give you all a little context. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Thiessen. Councillor Blackmore. I would be happy to make a motion if you're ready. Um, ready. I would move that council recommend, committee recommend council appoint a member of council to the Water North Coalition uh, with the member of administration acting in supporting, in a supporting role. And speaking to that, my, um, um, I believe that as a municipality that speaks very highly of our participation in regional matters, uh, this simply goes to strengthen that role and uh, it's not an onerous duty. So I would be voting in favor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that motion's in order. We'll call the question. That's carried unanimously, thank you. Well done. Okay, we'll now move on to uh, item 3.3, my favorite city pothole maintenance. And I'll pass that over to who's taking Mr. Robert Carroll, would you take the ball away? Okay, oh, there we go. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, we were directed by, uh, by committee to bring back a report uh, regarding our current pothole maintenance standards and and uh, how we compare with uh, other municipalities. So um, a couple of takeaways that uh, came out of the report, which which everybody has and has probably already read, is that uh, we do have uh, a robust uh, pothole repair uh, program and uh, so much, uh, uh, and there is some detail in the report about the, the uh, the uh, different uh, procedures that we uh, we use to repair potholes, and so much uh, depends on the time of year and the conditions. Obviously, uh, when we're in uh, summer conditions, as we are right right, right now, where uh, we have uh, the opportunity to do uh, more permanent repairs in our potholes, where we have uh, 
uh, hot mixes available, and uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, the temperatures are, are favorable for for uh, the uh, um, more permanent repair as compared to in the in the summertime and coming or the winter time coming out of uh, this, the the uh, winter with our freeze thaws, and uh, we've got uh, a high volume of potholes. Uh, the repairs uh, that uh, we may uh, 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 take take on at that point in time are more of a temporary and it's more to reduce the hazard and uh, move on to the next and uh, make, try to make uh, the roads as safe as we can for the public. A little bit of the comparators that we did with uh, other municipalities, uh, we have very similar programs uh, with uh, most of our major comparators. Uh, most most uh, municipalities have a, uh, a reporting structure where you can report a pothole. Uh, uh, the city has a you know, very good uh, a procedure for uh, for getting uh, the information from the field. Uh, the uh, we uh, have a uh, our, our contact center, of course, is uh, uh, equipped to uh, take information from the public. Uh, we do have a section on our on the city's webpage uh, to report a pothole, and uh, when we do get a report, uh, the uh, the way that we uh, triage those is that uh, it goes uh, through through the uh, contact center to. Uh, one of our supervisors who will uh, be dispatched to the field, uh, do a, a quick investigation of the pothole and determine at that time whether it's something that we have to uh, deal with right away with either a, a repair or some sort of barricade or if it's a more minor type of uh, pothole, we can come back at, uh, at uh, some point in time and do the repair. Uh, we use technology to kind of keep track of these for us. Number one, as far as the report uh, getting uh, to the supervisor, it's through our our uh, our, our service uh, our, our 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 service request system through uh, the contact center, and uh, we keep track of the potholes through a pothole app uh, that uh, uh, keeps track of them on a on a map. And uh, when we do the repair, uh, we can uh, update the uh, status of that pothole through the app. Uh, we're, we are protected, you know, through uh, the uh, Municipal Government Act, which uh, kind of limits uh, the city's liability for potholes. And uh, it, it's if we got crews out who are repairing potholes, which uh, you know normally, depending on the time of the year, uh, we may have crews out 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week doing pothole repair. So uh, we're constantly repairing potholes. It's a, a major uh, a part of our asphalt program uh, for pothole repair and. Uh, uh, you know, we, we try to keep on top of most of them the best we can. And I'll take some questions if anybody has any. Well, that's a very good report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carroll. Uh, Councillor Blackmore is in the queue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carroll. I, I was uh, impressed to note that we have as good, if not better, pothole policy than the other communities that you looked at. Um, I have two questions about that though. One is uh, the other communities, particularly Calgary, for example, have uh, a, an expectation that they will repair potholes in a certain timeline, depending on whether it's priority one, two, three road or whether it's a driving lane. Uh, do we do that as well? Or do we just simply attack them with all veracity? Uh, it, thanks, Seth, through the chair. Um, Certainly, uh, when we do get a report, whether it's uh, received through a contact center or through uh, the uh, uh, the just uh, some of the inspections that our, our staff does uh, on on a regular basis, um, we do uh, uh, try our best to get it repaired as quickly as possible. Uh, we don't have any firm timelines uh, with regard to how quickly we get to repair them. Uh, it's uh, uh, a a triage within the first twenty four hours is our in internal response time uh, that we expect our supervisors to meet where they get to the site, uh, investigate the pothole and act accordingly from there. Uh, we don't uh, have any time standard in place that we will get to a certain area and repair that pothole. It's uh, more triaged by our supervisory staff and uh, acted on accordingly. So by triage, then your supervisor will determine whether or not it's a high priority or less important to fix immediately yes, through the chair yes that's correct it's uh, you know based on where the pothole is uh, you know the the extent of the pothole and uh, whether it's a, a significant safety risk to the public and obviously if it's a significant risk 
uh, it will be acted upon uh, with uh, some strategy to uh, secure the area, whether it's barricading it until we can get a pothole crew there to repair it or immediate dispatch of the pothole crew. Okay, um, one further question. Under St. Albert, you, they respond with, um, I think it's St. Albert. Mm -hmm. With two spray injection machinery, I don't know what that is. Uh, through the chair, uh, it would be a, a Dura patch type machine, which we do have one, and uh, it's uh, almost a fully self-contained uh, machine that will, uh, first of all, blow the hole out, uh, dry it out to repair it, uh, apply some asphalt emulsion, which is a liquid tar type of uh, material, and then apply a uh, a, a layer of uh, gravelly type material to it, and uh, depending on the depth of the pothole, they may do several layers of that. So it's a Dura patch, which we have a program that uh, does these types of repairs throughout the summer. It's not something that we use in the wintertime uh, because of uh, temperatures and conditions. It's a more of a, of a spring summer type uh, repair procedure. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Bosch, then Mayor Clayton, and then I will jump in the queue. Uh, Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Thank you for the report. My question is, if you can help me remember, I thought we, purchased a hot mix piece of equipment to extend our hot mix season. Uh, what's the extension of the season with that? Uh, through the chair, uh, it, it gives us uh, the ability to produce hot mix asphalt year round. Uh, so if it's uh, you know in the middle of winter and uh, we want to do a, a more permanent repair on a more high profile type pothole, uh, we will gear up the uh, hot mix recycler, which uh, uses uh, you know salvage asphalt from some of our capital projects, or uh, we can uh, manufacture our own asphalt uh, using our products and some uh, some liquid asphalt from uh, from suppliers to uh, to basically make hot mix asphalt in the middle of February if uh, we see that that's uh, going to be a, a, a repair procedure to move forward with. Perfect. I think that's important for people to know. Also. Um, when there's a pothole that is is on private property, let's say you know some some commercial property, and a citizen calls in, do we let them know that that isn't city property or not? And if do we then contact the private property owners? Like, what's the procedure with that? Uh, th through the chair, when a, uh, a a pothole request comes in, mainly through a contact center, you know their first. Uh, 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 process that they work through is to determine you know where the pothole is and whether it's a city-owned pothole or it could be in a parking lot or a private road. So that's the uh, the first process that our, our contact center goes through. And uh, once it's determined the ownership, it's either sent to us or, and I'm not 100% sure as to what the contact center's process is, is to uh, inform the uh, private landowner whether of the uh, of the uh, pothole or. Uh, or what that process is, but I could certainly check on that for you. I think it's good for the public to know um, that not all potholes, you know, are the burden of the city and sometimes private property owners have to take accountability for the potholes that they should be dealing with and, and the city t takes the blame for it, you know, like, but um, if there's a process that they need to get to it, um, I think people should know that. Uh, thank you, Mayor Clayton. Connor, um, Mr. Carroll, can you tell me um, the comparisons that you have are, aren't what I would classify as winter cities. So can you tell me what municipalities that you considered in comparison that are what would be classified winter cities? Did you look at a Prince George model, a Yellowknife model, a Northern Manitoba model, any other sort of winter city type models? Um, th through the chair, um, we did uh, uh, some research uh, basically to uh, uh, look online with the other municipalities as to uh, what their reporting procedure, re procedures were like and uh, if they had standards versus policy and that type of thing. And uh, these uh, comparators were the, you know, at, at first glance, we didn't go into, you know, a whole lot of detail and uh, you know, as, as far as winter cities we we picked their our, our nearest competitors uh, with respect to that but uh, no we didn't uh, obviously uh, we could have spent uh, 
uh, uh, some further research and and did, done some uh, fur further uh, uh, re response with other with other uh, jurisdictions. But uh, for this report, uh, we thought that the uh, the sample that we use was uh, gives a good kind of representation as to what other people are doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, uh, one of the things this was uh, Councillor. Laner's uh, issue that he brought forward and unfortunately he didn't tell us what his thoughts were around this so um, one of the questions just for clarification roughly and this may sound like a silly question but I'm the guy that can ask it um, how many potholes have you got registered like are there 30,000 1200 million like so through the chair, uh, we do keep track of our potholes. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a pothole app, which uh, allows us to uh, coordinate our approach to, to uh, repairing potholes so that we uh, don't go into uh, you know, one neighborhood of the city and repair one pothole. We'll go into that neighborhood and uh, look at the app, see where the potholes are, and uh, do a strategic uh, repair so that uh, you know, we're, we're covering as much ground as we possibly can. Uh, the the uh, report does refer to the amount of potholes that we had repa reported through our contact center, and uh, it was you know I th I thought it would be quite a bit more. It was I think 357 I think was the number, so it, it wasn't huge. But that's one source. Uh, you know we do regular patrols. Uh, our supervisor do patrols, and they will enter those um, uh, potholes into the app uh, to be repaired uh, either. As I talked about earlier, triage and the repair, whether it's something that we have to dispatch uh, crews to immediately or it's something that can be uh, carried out as a repair when we're in the area. Uh, number wise, uh, you know, the, the app is, is great to keep track of you know, what's current and what's been repaired. Uh, there's lots of data there and uh, certainly if uh, a re you want a report generated, uh, uh, we can certainly do that for you and supply that information. Okay, that's uh, wonderful because my next question was how many potholes can your crew repair in a week or a month period because we have a finite period of repair time i'm just curious will that be part of that report that you would bring back uh, yes thanks uh, through the thanks chair um yes it's it's um uh, as far as repair uh it so much depends on the time of year and uh uh, the uh, the quality, like you know, sometimes uh, depending on time of year, it's more quantity than quality. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, for coming out of the the spring and we've got uh, a, a heavy report of potholes across the city, uh, we'll send a crew out to do a quick scatter and and try to uh, do as many repairs as they can with with probably a, a cold mix material, which is our most temporary patch. It's just mainly to uh, reduce the hazard uh, with the intention of coming back. At a later date and doing a more permanent repair, uh, but uh, you know, so much depends. It's hard for me to pull a number about how many repairs they can do a year. It depends on, you know, the depth of the pothole, the the extent of it, the location, uh, whether there's a, a robust traffic control uh, uh, procedure that has to go in place to close down that road so we can repair the pothole safely, or it's uh, you know on a more quiet road where it's basically you know get out of the truck uh, you do the repair and, and move on so uh, so many variables it's hard to say but uh, you know when we're, we're, we're actively pot patching potholes uh, we're going 24 hours a day so in a 24-hour day period we can get caught up quite quickly okay well thank you very much and uh, just one more is just uh, wondering, uh, Mayor Clayton uh, brought up this point about, uh, I was wondering if we could recommend that we take a look at some winter, uh, other winter cities so that we have the same comparable and uh, is, I don't want to put words in Mayor Clayton's mouth, but uh, I was wondering if that's possible and do you need a motion from us to do that? Thank you, Chair O'Connor. I think that's something that if council or committee was amenable to, we could uh, circulate to committee. But if you, if that is insufficient, we could certainly bring something back publicly. Okay. I'll go to Mayor Clayton. Mr. Chair O'Connor, I just want to clarify your expectations in regards to what administration is bringing for information. Um, in my mind, there's much more important work to do besides getting out and counting potholes. Um, I think that uh, the question that 
council and or committee need to to ask are are we getting do we have enough resources to get to all the potholes and if not are there new systems we need to be considering and what's the cost impact i just I just don't want us out counting potholes and coming back with reports and that whether or not council needs to decide if the system is working and ask questions are there other options if you don't feel it is working and what the uh, resource labor and money impacts are if it's not working to the standard that council's happy with I, I think that's very well said, Mayor Clayton, and I, I think that's, uh, in essence, what I would like to see happen. Are you willing to make a motion to that? That uh, probably Mr. Carroll has some answers for some of those questions now. Um, Mr. Carroll, um, Mr. Kerr. based on the resources you have, are you getting to a number of potholes that you think is adequate in regards to the expectations that we're doing in regards to filling potholes? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, certainly uh, much depends on time of year. Uh, when uh, we're coming out of a rough winter, uh, you know, certainly it, it can be overwhelming for staff to get a, get a, a good uh, handle on, on the situation. But uh, as I alluded to earlier, it, when we put crews out in 24 hours, you know, sometimes seven days a week, we can get caught up pretty quick. Uh, but uh, for, you know, 95% of the time, you know, uh, I think the re resources that we have, uh, the repair techniques that we have, uh, the equipment that we have uh, is adequate uh, to keep uh, a, a lid on the pothole repair uh, uh, that goes on within the city. Uh, that small amount of time where, you know, uh, we're running, running around trying to, you know, uh, uh, get ahead of things is, uh, is, a, is a, that time of year where I think no matter how much resources we have or, or what other uh, uh, procedures we have in our snow it's still going to be stressful but uh, that's that's that time of year and uh, it, it'll it'll come every year uh, whether uh, we're, we're geared up 10 times of what we have right now but uh, I, I feel as uh, the manager of this department that uh, we have a, a good strategy and we're able to kind of keep uh, keep ahead of things I have yes, uh, else, but go ahead CEO Nicolay yes uh, uh, CEO have it thank away. you mr. chairman and uh, thank you Mayor, it, uh, my comment is general, but it is in response to that issue, so I appreciate uh, going out of queue. Uh, this has been a, an excellent report and an excellent conversation about city standards and how those standards are affected by the resources that we dedicate to achieving and maintaining those standards. One of the things that our CFO is introducing in the budget process this year is a much more outcome-oriented key performance indicator conversation. So how, how, mu how many lane kilometers of paving can we do in a year? How many, whatever the appropriate measurement is for pothole repairs, can we do in a, in a year? Should become part of the budget discussion in general so that council can choose the community standards that you want to invest in and sustain and do that in comparison to other priority areas that the city is budgeting for. So I don't want to um, truncate the discussion by any means at this level, uh, but the report I think was very informative and this conversation has informed what we will hopefully uh, be able to talk to you about in much more detail during budget deliberations that are upcoming. That's an excellent answer. Uh, uh, just one second, uh, Mayor Clayton and then uh, Councilor Blackmore. No, I think I'm good. I mean. Um, as Mr. Carroll identified, they are exploring on a regular basis other operational opportunities for change and how they do this. Um, I'm good with this report. I don't have any motions coming out of this. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Councillor Blackmore. I'm generally pretty satisfied with the report. The one uh, issue that I see with potholes you may not ever have a solution for, and that is when you... Uh, early spring, late winter, when you're doing a temporary patches and overnight they're freezing and popping out. I'm wondering if you found, if you've noticed in other municipalities, if there's any kind of uh, more efficient patching system, uh, whether or not it would cost more money is not pertinent to this question. It's just, is there any technology out there that are making those uh, temporary patches more reliable? 
through the chair. Go ahead. Uh, certainly, um, there's not many weeks go by that I don't get a phone call or an email from somebody selling the latest and greatest uh, uh, pothole magic uh, that, uh, uh, you know, whether it's by the bag or, you know, they're going to drop a truckload of the stuff off. It, uh, you know, there's, there's subtle differences between them all, but they all behave pretty much the same when you're talking about a, a cold mix asphalt. Um, you know, the only difference is price, you know, and uh, we, we, we bulk make our materials for the most part, but, you know, we do experiment and through the years, uh, you know, it, uh, the, there was the, you know, the, the joke around the department that the boss has a new bag of stuff to try. <laughs> so, but, uh, you know, there's, there's not been uh, one magic bullet, obviously, and uh, us and uh, every other municipality around us is, uh, struggles with the same types of uh, challenges uh, at certain times of the year to make, make the darn stuff stick in the hole. And uh, it, uh, it, it comes down to, you know, tr more, you know, getting out, doing the repair, uh, uh, monitoring and repair, uh, going back and doing a re-repair if you have to until conditions allow us to do a proper repair. And, uh, you know, obviously that's where we are this time of year where we can do the, the proper repairs and most of our potholes are under control. But, uh, you know, the, the spring is going to come again and we're going to be running around uh, uh, doing the best we can to make the road safe. So, uh, uh, and, and, and that's, that's a for sure. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Carroll. And uh, seeing none, do we need a motion to accept this report? And uh, Mayor Clayton, uh, please do so. I would move that uh, the Infrastructure and Economic Development Committee accept this report for information. That motion's in order. Please call the vote. That's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent report, and thanks for putting up with all my questions. Appreciate it. Uh, we will now move on to item uh, 3.4, our storm wall utility, uh, Mr. Rory Durant. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair O'Connor. Uh, so before you uh, this morning, you have uh, the report on the stormwater utility. To give uh, just a very brief background, the uh, stormwater utility models have been explored since uh, July of uh, 2019, uh, when at a, a committee meeting, there was a request to have administration go back and look for, uh, to, to look at, at some of these models. Uh, so over the last three years, there's been exploration of uh, a number of different models for uh, stormwater utility and, and uh, has led us to, to where we are today. Uh, uh, earlier uh, this year, back in, in May, the uh, committee was presented with the stormwater utility, a couple of models, and the uh, committee directed uh, administration to go out to uh, look at uh, to, to go to public engagement and, and seek input on the, uh, on the various uh, models, on two of the models in particular. Um, so with the, uh, the two models that we went out with, there was the impervious surface uh, area model in which we would take the uh, expenses of the stormwater system that we currently have, remove those from the uh, cities uh, uh, being paid for through city taxes, and would be uh, paid for through a separate uh, utility fee that would be based on the uh, impervious area on a particular property. The other model that we explored was instead of looking at impervious uh, uh, area per parcel, that we look at the impervious area per category, so residential and commercial, and then we would just um, apply uh, based on assessment um, a rate based on the ratio between commercial and residential uh, properties. Uh, further background, uh, you'll see in the report there in the province right now, there are currently 16 municipalities that have a stormwater utility uh, in place. Um, you can see some of the larger ones, obviously Edmonton, Calgary, uh, Strathcona County, St. Albert. Um, 
uh, further in our research, Red Deer and Medicine Hat are currently pursuing uh, the Im implementation of a, a, a utility model as well. So we went out with these two models, and uh, you'll see in the uh, What We Heard report, uh, we had uh, a number of engagements. We had a couple of public sessions. Uh, we did a you know, social media campaign on it, and uh, we ran a, a survey. We also did, on, on this particular one, uh, we did a lot of targeted um, uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, identifying a number of, uh, of uh, groups and organizations in the community that uh, could be impacted uh, by this in a variety of different ways and, and uh, specifically went to them and, and offered to do presentations and to sit down with them and explain, uh, explain the model further. Uh, so you can see uh, a summary of, of all of those uh, conversations in there. A uh, couple of the themes that came out of the engagement, the one was there was a bit of confusion around having a separate utility whether that separate utility was going to be like an Aquaterra model or we were setting up a different company. So it was something that we had to provide some language on sort of mid-engagement to uh, uh, and, and really had to make it clear in, in, in the sessions we did that this is not, uh, we're not contemplating setting up a separate uh, uh, company or a third-party entity that would run the utility that would still be run uh, by the city and rates would be set on a yearly basis by, by city council. And uh, that would still f be fully within uh, within the city's control. A couple other themes that emerged was uh, transparency. Uh, you'll see in, in a lot of the comments that were provided through engagement, uh, there was general support for moving to the utility, but there was a big if. Um, you know whether you know we we had claimed this is going to be uh, revenue neutral or cost neutral, um, and whether uh, council was just using this um, whether that. The, the question was whether that was actually going to be true or whether council was just going to be using this as a way to, as a backdoor way to generate more revenues um, uh, for the city. And so uh, that, that uh, theme is, uh, was evident throughout is, you know, how transparent uh, this is going to be. Um, it's not include the report, but, but as part of that transparency, I think if uh, committee and, and council does decide to go ahead with that, uh, I think, it would be uh, important for administration to be providing uh, quarterly updates, at least in the development of the uh, utility and to really show the numbers, um, the numbers coming off the tax base, the numbers going into the utility and be very clear and transparent with the community there. Uh, something that was also uh, explained throughout the engagement was that we would be doing annual reports uh, that this, whoever was responsible for the stormwater utility on an annual basis would make an accounting of how much uh, revenue was generated through the utility and what the outputs were, where it went. And uh, so to, again, to address that uh, transparency piece. Uh, the other uh, third theme that, that em emerged was uh, regarding um, tax exempt properties. And you see a lot of uh, feedback regard to uh, you know, schools and uh, religious organizations and nonprofits uh, indicating um, that this would be a, you know additional burden front on them. Um, and so that uh, was a theme throughout. Um, you'll see in the uh, uh, results that uh, you know there's a very mix of opinions. Um, on balance, uh, there was a you know a slight majority that uh, were in favor of us moving to of the city moving towards uh, uh, a model, um, but that wasn't uh, wasn't a strong majority. But uh, there was a you know slight slight preference uh, there. Uh, of the two uh, models, there was a you know slight preference towards the pure impervious surface area model, um, and uh, as compared to the assessment based model. If uh, committee does go ahead uh, and, and council does choose to move ahead with the stormwater utility, um, there would be just to give you a, an idea of next steps. There would be a, a number of refinements that would have to be made to the model. Um, obviously, over the last three years, we've we've done different levels of refinement uh, to get to the models and, and the numbers as accurate as we can. Um, if if we're going ahead at uh, at this point, we would actually start building the system and processes and and actually doing you know the, obviously the very detailed uh, analysis and refinement of of the models, which includes uh, some of the updated mapping that from the ortho photos this year, including updated uh, tax rolls and. Uh, Obviously, uh, determining where the billing provider would, uh, who who would be the billing provider. 
Uh, our anticipated timeline would be that uh, if council uh, pursues this, uh, that uh, we would spend the, the rest of the year uh, building that model, refining it, doing all the all the GIS work on it, and uh, uh, come to council in the beginning of January uh, with a number of decisions. And you'll see in the report there, there's a number of decisions that uh, um, uh, council would have to make um, at that point. You know. Is there a level of exemption for some nonprofits or all nonprofits? Uh, is there um, how, how much of a tax reduction do we provide to the various categories? Um, so there, there is uh, will be more opportunity for further input into the model. At those point, the uh, January, if council does proceed, uh, continues on there, there would be um, final bylaws and policies presented. Uh, somewhere in, in the second quarter, uh, likely uh, May or June, and with the intent of July 1st being when notices of assessment would go out, and there would be a six-month uh, notice of assessment period where property owners could uh, apply for credits, they could uh, challenge their assessment um, for the fee, uh, and uh, have any uh, questions answered on that. With the final implementation being January 1st, 2024. Uh, so that is, that's the anticipated uh, timeline should council uh, proceed uh, with, with the utility. With that uh, concludes my report and I'll open up to, uh, to questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rory. Excellent report. Uh, Councillor Berg is in the queue. Thank you, Chair O'Connor and thanks, Rory. Um, so we in council are very well informed on this and, and I think you've got potential buy-in, but when I was reading all of the citizen report comments, um, and again, you flagged them as either informed or engaged, but there was a lot of confusion that I was reading in there and a lot of false ideas around it. And again, we're qualifying these people as informed or engaged. Uh, should we go through with this, I need absolute assurances that this will be messaged and promoted properly. Otherwise, this could be the most amazing thing in the world, but if it's not messaged properly, it could blow up. And, and uh, I, I kind of saw that in a lot of the comments, that there was just lot, not a lot of understanding in them. Uh, through the chair, uh, absolutely. We, we learned a lot through the engagement, and that's part of the reason we go through these engagement processes is to find out, uh, you know, where if there's certain points that are being misunderstood uh, or if there's areas for, for improvement in, in the messaging. Um, and throughout the engagement, we were able to adapt, and, and we had a, you know, a, a frequently asked questions uh, page on our engagement site that we were continually continuously updating with uh, further information um, as those questions were, were answered. Um, a number of the people participated in that question space uh, area on the engagement site, and uh, we were able to answer uh, questions uh, through that. Um, you know, and obviously through our, a lot of our stakeholder engagement sessions that we did uh, publicly, uh, able to answer questions and, and refine pieces there. Uh, but there is yeah, a number of areas that uh, I think we would adapt and change our messaging to make sure that they're very, very clear. Yeah, because I think going forward, again, should it be launched to the city, you're talking to 60, 70,000 people as opposed to 150. Thanks. Yes, and uh, unless somebody else wants to jump in, I think it's really important. One of the messages that I saw in reading the report was the uh, churches and the nonprofits uh, would felt that they would be because they have, all they have are parking lots. Uh, would be adversely affected. So I'm wondering if there's any thought to coming forward and saying we're going to make these exempt or give them feedbacks. I think I saw something in your report that said that. Could you address that, please? Uh, to the chair, the uh, the thought is that we would build out the model um, to have a the you know, highest degree of accuracy, as if you know this would be the system that's that's going to be implemented. So we didn't know the exact numbers. Um, obviously, with the uh, updated um, numbers in terms of the uh, um, you know our average capital spend and, and the current operations, uh, and at that point we would be um, going to council in again in January and having uh, those would be one of the dis discussion points, right? Uh, to say you know if there was um, if we included all tax exempt properties within the utility 
it would cost this much if uh, uh, you know we exempted you know these certain ones you know based on council's feedback this is how they would affect the utility uh, so there will be that that opportunity to have that that input then okay thank you uh, councillor Blackmore then councillor Thiessen and councillor Bosch um, I don't have a question and I think that committee is where questions should happen and debate it should happen at council table so if there's questions I think you should probably go to them and then come back to me for a motion okay councillor Thiessen based off uh, councillor Blackmore's uh, statement here uh, I'm just going to make a comment I didn't have a question uh, so I thought that the engagement was really good. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sally, Mr. Tarrant, for uh, putting aside your time in the evenings and daytime to educate people about this. Uh, one of my, I, I know that Councillor O'Connor, you, you stated that uh, not-for-profits and churches. Um, I, I'm more inclined to believe that we, we might be able to look into that and that'll come out through the discussions. The one area that I'll just like put my caution forward to is uh, with the school sites and largely because I'm not sure what the what the calculation will be between impermeable for service or surface and having all that grassland that they have usually around schools like for field space and stuff like that but yeah my, my preference going forward in discussions would probably be to omit the schools because any additional costs that we put on them we'll likely see in in our education requisition tax, which means that what we're promising people is that this will help lower their taxes. We'll just get a rebound, I'm almost certain of it, on the costs uh, back to the property owner, and then we'll get blamed for it, even though it's the province taking that money because of the extra charge. So I, I look forward to the discussions, and uh, I'm very appreciative of the hard work and the recommendations and presenting everything that people said unedited. Thank you very much. Councillor Bosch. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. I guess I do have a, some concerns similar to Councillor Berg in regards to the understanding of this. Like, I think the majority of the population needs to know this is, this is strictly a utility. It is, it is not a tax. Um, and we're, in fact, trying to take it out of the tax base so that what people think that our taxes is in, is including this stormwater model but or stormwater and s sometimes people say that our taxes is too high but so to separate them um shows the utility piece versus the tax piece i i get that but if we're going to you know just i don't know it feels like a hamster wheel you, you, you're gonna do all these consultations and all these um you know numbers and then we're going to go back to well i don't want it i do want it i don't want it so how, how far do you go with this like not for profits um you know schools um commercial residential it just it seems like it's never ending because obviously it's it's not going to work out perfectly for everyone um for me model one for pay for use um seems to make sense versus a vague um, model two. It seems too broad to me. But um, but then all the other variables of the not-for-profits and the school systems and the colleges and the uh, provincial buildings then tie into each of these models. So even if we do agree on one of these, there's so many different variables to come into that agreed um, model to begin with. So. I just don't want to see you guys just absolutely just churning out numbers and and we don't come up with a, an option because there's the what ifs that always that always run into it you know and I think the population needs to know is that this is strictly utility you know it's a til utility um, consideration and transparency uh, and maybe that has to tie in with with the understanding of it I'm not sure uh, thank you, Councillor Bosch. And before I, uh, count, uh, Mayor Clayton, and then uh, to close will be Councillor Blackmore. Thanks, Chair O'Connor. Um, we've had so many discussions on this, I kind of forget what I do know and what I don't know anymore. It's been such a long conversation. Uh, Mr. Tarrant, can you tell me why uh, administration's recommendation is um, 
that the utility be structured on the impervious area fee model as opposed to um, the other option which has potential modifiers in it? Uh, through the chair, the, uh, the thought behind the recommendation be, be, uh, going forward with the impervious surface model is that it has the highest degree of accuracy. And when we were talking about uh, setting up a utility, if we want to actually have a utility that is um, user-based and user fee-based and based on the, someone's particular property's impact to the system, this is the most accurate and most aligns with with that particular uh, value and, and that particular benefit of the system. Um, and we thought that that uh, being that that was one of the key um, priorities of the system was that it becomes user-based and that uh, we have the, someone's impact on the system reflected in that utility rate, that this is the model that would best suit that particular, uh, that particular value. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And to Councillor Blackmore. Uh, be before I make a motion, I just have one quick question, Mr. Tarrant. Um, although the impervious model is more transparent and accurate, it is also open to modifiers as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. And there's, you know, we've explored many different uh, modifiers to, uh, to do that, you know, whether there's caps. Um, you know, whether there's uh, tiers, there, there's a variety of different pieces that could be uh, put in place. Thank you. Just one second. Mayor Clayton wanted to jump in. Yeah, just a question on Councillor Blackmore's comment. Um, um, I think I know what Councillor Blackmore's motion is going to be. I'm curious, once we get to Council, um, how comfortable administration is to be modifying the models in that arena. Would you rather have those discussions? Um, in preparation ahead of time, what's your preference? Uh, through the chair, the intent, uh, once we have the model uh, fully built up and all the numbers uh, crunched and have a system in place, then it becomes quite easy to, to play with some of those modifiers, whether we put caps on, whether we um, you know, change, you know, whether there's exemptions for certain properties or not, uh, whether certain properties are in or out, whether we include agricultural lands, you know, some of those pieces, it's easy to pull those pieces in or out, um, but we need the model fully built out and robust um, and the systems in place. Um, and once that's there, um, that, that could be uh, done. Um, also, you know, in future years, if council did want to adapt or change or if there, you know, a future council's finding impact, you know, once that system is built, it can be adapted. So that that's uh, administration's preference is to let us, uh, council does want to pursue it. Uh, let's build the model fully as if everybody's involved, that this would apply to all properties, and then we can make those modifications. Um. So if I can, Mr. Chairman, so uh, if um, committee in turn sends this to council for approval in, on the surface area model, will there be a reasonable opportunity for conversation prior to um, the sending out of the bills where council can have an impact on the modifiers? Through the chair, absolutely. Uh, the intent is that uh, early, one of the first committee meetings in, uh, or, or council meetings in, in January, that uh, at that point we'd be ready to present uh, a variety, there you know, probably four or five different key questions uh, that council would have input on. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, and comment, uh, I think the, I've heard overall that we need to keep it simple. Uh, we know the KISS method, so I think it's really important that we get that and the message is correct. So, Councillor Backmore. Um, I would move that committee recommend council proceed with the implementation of a stormwater utility that is structured on an impervious surface area fee model. And in speaking to that, I believe the impervious uh, s surface fee model is the most accurate and um, allows for the most um, significant kind of modification. It's, it's easier to modify something that is accurate than something that is already uh, kind of on the loose side. So I would ask council to support this motion. The that, committee to support the motion. Thank you. Uh, that motion is in order. We'll call the question.
Mayor Clayton, in favor. That was carried unanimously. Thank you for the great debate. I think it was very uh, building for us as council at committee to be able to uh, accept this report. And thank you very much for all your hard work. Uh, we'll now move on to four correspondence. There is none. Uh, five, there is no other business. Uh, six, there is no bylaw and policy review. We will go to seven outstanding items list. Director Glavin. Thank you, Chair O'Connor. Today we have dealt with items 1197 and 1208, and uh, the rest of the items on the list are on track. Yes, I will. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions of Director Glavin? If not, I will entertain a motion. Uh, Councillor Blackmore? I would move that the outstanding items list is accepted for information. Thank you. We will call the question. And that's carried unanimously. With that, we adjourn the meeting. Thank you and have a great day.